This is FRM Part 1, Book 4, Valuation and Risk Management, and the chapter on binomial trees, which could be called How Binomial Trees Will Help Us Compute the Value of a Call Option. Let me show you what I mean looking at these learning objectives here. Notice what we're going to do. That first one is really important. Uh, we're going to use either the one or the two-step binomial model to compute the value of an American or European option. Of course, one of the inputs in the model is volatility, so that's going to be really important. Um, we're also going to add a couple of other variables like what do we do with dividends, uh, how do we deal with a double derivative, an option on a futures contract, and then we'll end with a discussion of delta, which we talked about in that previous chapter and we learned how important that delta is in option pricing and in risk management principles in general. So let's go ahead and take a look at this binomial model here. Before we get into any of the description, let's look at the picture in the middle on the right there. Notice, notice on the left-hand side, there is an S sub zero. That stands for the stock price today. And in this binomial model, what we're doing is we're assuming that there are buy, right? Binomial means that the stock price can either go up or the stock price can go down. Now, instead of just saying something like, oh, if the price today of a share of stock is 100 and at the end of the next period, whether that's a week or a month or a year, it's going to be either 154 or 97 you know some goes up one one step goes up one step goes down what we're going to do is we are going to use some assumptions about volatility so that we can actually predict what that price is going to be so notice there's an arrow going up and an arrow going down so the stock price today is some number let's say 100 and then the stock price at the end of the first time period is going to be that 100, the stock price today, times the size of an up factor. That's why there's a U there. And then, of course, there's the down arrow, and the stock price at the end of that first period is going to be the stock price today times uh, some down factor. And then they're going to be weighted by the uh, probabilities. And so there's that little thing, that pi with a U and a pi with a D. So that's going to be uh, probability of an up and the probability of a down. So really this binomial model simply tells us, I mean in the big picture format, it simply tells us that the stock price can go up or down and that going up or down amount is going to depend on things like time and of course volatility. All right, so let's take a look at some of these uh, definitions. So notice what I have there. I have U and D. They are the size of the up move and the size of the down move factor. And they're going to be a function of, and we're going to use our little E raised to the X button on our calculator. We're going to take that E for continuous time finance, of course, and we're going to raise it to the standard deviation times the square root of time. And of course, we learned back in that last chapter that the standard deviation moves through time at the square root. And then, of course, the down factor is going to be E raised to the minus standard deviation times the square root of time. And so what I want you to do is I want you to think about this kind of like in its time value of money framework. It's really it's really kind of like compounding. I mean, we're not compounding it out at a continuously compounded risk free rate of interest, but we're kind of compounding it out um, according to its volatility. So think about this. One is a future value and uh, and one is compounding and one is discounting. And so you're going to have an up price, which is going to be greater than the stock price today. And you're going to have a down price, which is going to be less than the stock price today. Uh, let's see. The, the uh, probability of an up move is defined as that E raised to the RT. Now we're doing compounding. So that's continuous compounding there. We're going to subtract out the down factor. And then in the denominator, we're going to subtract out the difference between the up factor and the down factor. And so those are probabilities of up and down moves. And so this really goes back to, boy, I don't know when do you first learn uh, how to compute uh, a weighted average return 
you know, maybe this isn't high school, maybe this isn't college, but it's really a simple model. Of course, let me prove it to you, a simple one period binomial model with an example. All right, so let's suppose we have stock price today that pays no dividends, $30. Um, let's assume we have a standard deviation of 17% and then the risk-free re return compounded continuously is 5%. All right, so all of that stuff, all of that stuff goes on in the equity markets, right? Floor of the New York Stock Exchange and the credit markets, the floor of the, uh, of the treasury bill market, right? <clears throat> but now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, all right, how does that stuff relate to what's going on over in the derivatives market? So let's go ahead and assume we've got a one year call option with a strike or an exercise price of $30. So we'll, let's make sure you understand this. We have this call option that gives us the right, but not the obligation to buy a share of stock at $30 while the stock is trading over on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange at $30. We call this an at the money option. And so the question then becomes, if I'm writing this option to you, I'm the writer of the option, I'm Jim's financial institution, and you're just a regular old investor, whether you're an individual investor or an institutional investor, you come to me and you say, hey, Jim, I want to buy this option and at the money option. So the question is, how much am I going to charge you for writing this option? And then, and then from your perspective, how much are you willing to pay uh, in, a fair, in a fair market? How much are you willing to pay? How much am I willing to charge? All right, so the first thing is let's go ahead and compute uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, inputs that are important. So the U turns out to be 1.18 and the D turns out to be 0.84 and I'm rounding there a little bit. So think about this. <clears throat> what that means is that we're going to compound that current stock price of $30 at, at an 18%, you know, kind of a volatility. So we're going to have, we're going to push that up move we're going to push that up around 18%, and then we're going to push it down around 16%. And then, of course, the risk neutral probabilities are 0.61, and that's an easy calculation. And then you subtract that from one, and you get uh, 0.39. Of course, of course, those probabilities have to sum to one. Now, let me make a comment here about these risk neutral probabilities. One of the key assumptions in this model is that we assume that investors are risk neutral. And what that means is that um, investors, when they decide on a required rate of return, they can ignore risk. In other words, the return doesn't depend on the amount of risk taken in that particular type of an investment. Now, that should sound to you like these are crazy assumptions. And in fact, this risk neutral assumption really doesn't match up with what we see in the real kind of live action uh, trading that goes on in financial markets throughout, throughout the world. But the really, really cool thing about this risk neutral assumption is that it allows us in the derivatives markets, it allows us in the option market to accurately price a call option like we're going to do here. Now, I encourage you to go back to that source reading because there's a really, really cool section on uh, risk neutral probabilities and a terrific explanation um, of this assumption. All right, so this is what we're gonna do here, ready? So we start with $30 in exhibit one. We know that's the current price today. That's observable, right? So what we've done is we've, take, we've taken a measure of standard deviation and we're compounding it up to 3560, right? So we're gonna multiply the $30 times 1.1853. So when the stock price goes up, it's gonna go up to $35.60. When it goes down, it's gonna go down to $25.30. All right, so this is why it's called the binomial model. We start at 30, we're gonna end up either at around 35 or around 25. All right, so then the question is, how does that future path of stock prices affect how much we're gonna be willing to pay for that option today. So here's the cool thing. If the stock price goes up to 35.60, then, now remember this is at the end of the period, which is when the option expires, then 
our option will be worth $5.60, right? We have the right but not the obligation to buy at 30 when the stock is now trading at 35.60. So in that case, the option will have an intrinsic value of $5.60, won't have any time value because the option uh, will be expiring, right? So a year from now, if the stock price goes up, we can look forward to getting $5.60. If the stock price goes down, the option will finish out of the money, so the option is worth zero dollars. So one year from today, notice my first uh, my first block point underneath the two uh, the two charts. I have the expected value of the option in one year is five dollars and sixty cents plus the zero dollars. Now, of course, we're not going to divide that by two because. What did we do back here? We did those risk and neutral probabilities. So we need to multiply those two possible outcomes, 560 times the 61%, and then the zero times the 39%. And so that gives us an expected value of the option in one year of $3.42, right? So that's what we expect to happen today. We know we have, we have some chance that the stock price is going to go up, which would be good news for us as owners of the call option. We know there's that we know there is some chance that the stock price will go down, which is bad news for us as owners of the options. And so what we do is we probability weight those two future outcomes and we get three dollars and forty two cents. Of course, that's a future value. We need to take the present value of that thing and we're going to assume continuous time, uh, continuous time compounding again. And so we're going to take that E and we're going to raise it to the uh, 0.05 times one, of course, negative since we're doing present value. And that gives us a price of the call option of three dollars and twenty five cents today. Wow, this is so cool. What have you learned back in even maybe in high school and in, certainly in your college days? And then, of course, throughout uh, throughout this uh, FRM program, you learn that the price of any security is the present value of those expected payoffs or whenever they occur in the future. So this is the really cool example. And this model is really cool because given these risk neutral probabilities, what it does is it enables us to calculate the price of a real world option. And so that's going to give us three dollars and twenty five cents. So back to my original framework. So you come to me and say, hey, Jim, I want to buy this option and at the money option. And given these conditions, let's go back here, given uh, given those conditions there, I'm going to say to you, hey, uh, you need you owe me three dollars and twenty five cents. So you're going to pay me that three dollars and twenty five cents today. I'm going to hand you a piece of paper that gives you the right but not the obligation to buy that share of stock from me for $30. And then we let one year go by, right? And you can exercise this whenever you want. If it's an American option, you can wait until the end if it's a European option. And I think this was a European option in this example. But nevertheless, uh, regardless of what happens at the end, at the end of one year, you're either going to exercise or you're not going to exercise. And that's, of course, assuming that you didn't sell the option during the course of the year. And you're either going to get 560 or you're going to get zero. So this is a really cool example. Now, of course, we did the simplest of all uh, framework in terms of time with the one peer period model. We can extend that to two periods. And so note what happens here that we start with the stock price today and then the stock price can either go up and then up again or it can go down and then down again or it can go up and down or it can go down and up and whether it goes up or down or down or up it, arri it arrives at that same price in the middle so think over there above s sub zero that's time period zero and then s sub u and s sub d that's time period one and then s sub u u or u d or d d that that's time period two so there's the two period uh, binomial model and of course to compute the price of a call option today we're going to do the same thing that we did in the previous example but instead of discounting back one period with two possible outcomes we're going to discount back two periods with three possible outcomes All right, so really the important thing about any kind of option pricing, and I said this to you in the previous chapter, is you know, 
how do we come up with the, the important critical input of a standard deviation? And so what really is cool about this binomial model is that what we see is that as the standard deviation increases, you know, what did we have in that previous example? What was that? 17%. If we change that to 27% or 37%, what that means is that dispersion between the stock prices and the up and down states, that's, that's going to increase, right? Well, we're going to have a higher, we're going to have a higher price in that, in that first and second period, whether we use the first, uh, the one period or the two period binomial model. And so we have those higher, those higher outputs or those higher payoffs, which means when we take present values, they're going to be higher. All right. So notice uh, a simple statement I have in that first uh, circle point. If there were no deviation at all, then there would be no binomial tree, right? That tree goes like this and has all the, it starts here and it has all the branches out here, but instead we would just have, uh, we would have a straight line. All right, so how can we change this binomial model if we have a dividend paying stock, for example? Well, this is a pretty simple addition to the model. Um, let's suppose that we have a stock that pays a continuous dividend yield. And what we're gonna do is those probabilities of up and down is going to reflect the simple fact that if you own the option, if you own the option, then you will not receive any of those dividend payments. So you have to kind of net that out. So notice there in, in the numerator of the probability of an up move, uh, we're gonna take that risk-free rate of interest and we're gonna subtract out the continuous dividend yield for the simple fact that the owner in the derivative market doesn't really own the shares. Uh, in the equity market, so that investor won't receive the dividend yield, so you just take it out. Uh, you can also do the same thing if you're computing the price of a call option on a stock in index, and so you just do the same thing, and you'll take the S&P 500 index, you'll take, you'll take the dividend yield on the S&P 500 index. Now, how about if we talk about this really cool thing, an option on a futures contract? So think about what this means. You have the right, but not the obligation to take either the long or the short position in a futures contract. I call this a double derivative. I've never really seen that in print anywhere. So you, you, have, a, you have a derivative on top of another derivative. And so what we're really going to do is we're just going to remove that. Uh, we're going to remove that e to the rt that compounding out and we'll just do we'll just do uh, instead of 1.0 something something we'll just do 1 minus d over u minus d uh, for an option on a futures contract and then for currencies uh, we can use the same model but we need to adjust the simple fact that risk-free rate in one country is going to be different than the risk-free rate in a different country so that's why we take the difference between the return on the domestic currency and the return on the foreign currency now to value american options what we need to do is check for an early exercise at each node remember with the american exercise with the american option you can exercise it at almost any time even though you're probably not going to do this in most cases because you'll give up the time value but what we're going to do is if the value of the option is greater when exercised and then there are some cases when it will be then we will assign that value to the node and then if it's not the case then it will just be uh the value of the option unexercised and you just work your way back through the tree the same way now what we have done um, is we have go, gone ahead and jumped to continuous time finance um, in all of our examples in this case but when i present this to my students and when this is first presented in almost all textbooks especially derivative textbooks it's always given in terms of discrete compounding um, but what we're going to do is we'll, we're going to assume that those models, that those time periods are shrunken down to arbitrarily small values. And so we're going to end up with the continuous. Um, what we're going to see going forward is that when, you know, what did we do? We started a year and then six months and then and then and then and then when you chop the time period up into really, really small pieces, uh, we're going to see the binomial model converges to some really, really special model. How about if I leave that as a cliffhanger to, uh, to, our, next, uh, to our next chapter? Anyway, so there's the, uh, there are the learning out, uh, objectives. 
And so we had a good conversation on binomial trees.